What's up, y'all? It's Mimi from Producer Talk on Producer Culture. And today we have multi platinum producer yeah. Takey Fu, um, known for producing for Drake, Cardi B, Travis Scott, Beyonce, damn, we can name a lot, Future, and more. So before we get started, today I'm going to ask a few icebreaker questions and then we're going to play a little icebreaker game. If we had ringtones today, what would be your ringtone? Oh. Uh. Life goes on, mm. my little baby. That's a good one. That's, I like that. That's song. one of my favorite songs. What is something that we wouldn't know about you? Show hit it. I know how to draw. For real? Yeah, I know how to draw. I know how to paint. All this shit. Okay. Cause I used to, I used to draw when I was a young nigga, That's like fine. In, um, elementary and middle school and shit. I used to draw niggas' shoes and sit oh, like on the Jordans. Yeah, and sit That's on the picture right. I drew with like lunch money, slush money, and cookies and shit like that. Oh, you was hustling from a young age. Yeah, I ain't. I wasn't hustling because I wasn't saving it, but shit, I was. You know <laughs> but you was getting to it, I was though. getting to it, yeah. yeah. Name a song that you can't listen to anymore, like you just overplayed it. Mm. Damn, that's a good one. It had to be one of my songs. Um, I can't even tell you off the top of my head. You can't it's one it. of my songs, though. Like, I, I just... It be cringe when you sometimes like songs you didn't expect to be like that big. You know what I'm saying? You get to plan that motherfucker out. I can't even think though. But that's a good question. Thank you. So you want to tell everybody where we are right now? Yeah, we in Nashville. We in Middle Tennessee. Um, I'm from Memphis, but I went to school out here. Went to college. And, um, I got a spot out here. I spend a lot of my time here. Um, I do a lot of my work here. You know, my clothes on. Um, Family, which were, were friends that turned to family, live out here. You know what I'm saying? So, out of all three places that you live, which place do you like the most? You like this one better? Um, I like LA. I, I like them all for different reasons. You know what I'm saying? Um, because it's a, it's a perfect balance for me, so I can explain to you. Like staying in Nashville, it's the balance because um, I get a peace of mind. You know, I ain't got to worry about who I might run into. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I can go do whatever, grocery shop, go out to the movies, whatever. Of course, people recognize me, but it's not like a big factor. Um, when it comes to staying in um, Atlanta, it's like, uh, it's fun, you know. I get to uh, go out with my family and shit. That's where I move my folks to. And, you know, um, it's work and shit too. But um, as far as LA, that's where I get a lot of shit done. I can get like six months worth of work done in a week. Then mm -hmm. like work work like I'm in the studio with big A list artists down there every day when I'm in LA while I'm out there. So it's like a perfect balance for me and that and, and it's a structure that I kinda been doing for like the past two or three years that been working for me. So you having think, that balance. So you think LA in LA you get the most work done? Yeah. Most definitely because you you can you know, I might stay around the corner from this studio, you know, I could just pull up any time and work with, you know, these artists. Different and, artists, yeah. yeah. A lot of artists do be in LA. Yeah. Your accent is like really, really thick. Tell us about Memphis culture. Like, what's three facts about Memphis that like nobody would know? If you from Memphis, you ain't never been to Elvis house. You what's always that? drove past Elvis house, the Elvis estate, but you never went. What That's is that? A, Elvis, Elvis Presley. Oh. Like his house. Oh, okay. You, if you from Memphis, you ain't never been to his house like on no tour or nothing. Like it's a like a main attraction in in Memphis. But if you from Memphis, you never been there. That's damn the ninety nine percent fact. Wow. If you from Memphis, you ain't never been to Elvis' house. Um, another thing is, if you from Memphis, you ain't going through Barley. Barley like a, a town outside of Memphis, you ain't going through Barley. Cause the police be hot, so you gonna go around and you gonna, you know what I'm saying? You ain't gonna go down stage. You gonna down there, get on the e way and go around to get where you going. Proving fact, don't nobody like driving through Barley. Um, you said three facts. Mm -hmm. a, a third facts is um, Memphis got the best hot wings. For real? I don't yeah. know about that. Atlanta nah. got the best wings. I mean, they good too, but I think Memphis got get, Memphis. Damn, they got them beat. I ain't gonna lie. It's up there mm. for sure. I'm gonna have to go try I'm that. I'm telling you, you gonna, cause Memphis, yeah, everybody from Memphis know they wings made a certain way type shit. Where it's like, motherfuckers, like, know it's Memphis wings. You so what's your favorite part about Memphis? Um, the culture, cause it's so strong. You know, it's like, we 
in Memphis are like it's 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 like for it to be a small city, the culture so strong musically, the food, you know what I'm saying? Like just like the whole nine yards, like everybody know everybody or if I don't know you, I then I know your best friend or your cousin or some shit like that. Like everybody, everybody like know each other. Yeah, or you know, everybody know like the city small then like Everybody connected like on Facebook and shit too. Y'all do use Facebook a lot in Memphis. Yeah, we do. So, what's like a Memphis artist that you haven't worked with yet that you want to work with? Um, I'm gonna say that's a good one. I'm gonna say DJ Paul mm. because um I worked with Juicy J before, um but I haven't worked with DJ Paul yet. So that'd know, be hard. I want to work with him. We could look out for that soon. Yeah, I just uh, seen him at the game last week. That'd be hard. Yeah. Have you worked with Glover Lil yet? Yeah, I, I've been working with her. Okay. Yeah, we we got, got some, some shit. Up yeah, we got some shit up the sleeve for sure. Okay, that's dope. Your accent is so so heavy. I did not know that you said Elvis. It sounded like you said like Evans or something. No. Nah. And I be and I be I be correcting myself a little bit, so I don't really just be. I, I I be having like compared to how I'm talking and yeah, other Memphis motherfuckers, you, oh, you yeah. know what I'm saying? It's a big there, difference. It's like, real heavy, yeah. yeah. It's real heavy. So I, I didn't got better with it since I've been, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So what's your background in music? Like, how did you get started in music? My background in music is um when I was younger, my mama was married and um, my stepdaddy, like, he kind of pretty much like had made me have a, a good taste in music because he had like a car and um, had speakers and shit in the car. So, you know, a lot of songs I remember because of the loud bass and shit like that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, you know, they knew I was always like wanted to, to do music and shit. So they bought me like, it was like a little small little keyboard to, to play on. And um, when I had that keyboard, like I said, in other interviews, I used to like re replay songs and shit like, um, lollipop and shit like that you know just like play a little shit on there and um i eventually we had like a rock band game mm. like you know you remember the guy in rock band mm -hmm. and they had a, a mic the mic was was like part of the game the drum set the guitar and the mic so uh that was like on playstation 3 i think yeah that was some shit. Long yeah ago. long long time ago but um i had plugged the mic up one time in the computer and I was just fucking with the, the, you know, the vocals and recording and shit. I just ran with it. I just started doing my own shit, trying to play, make songs and shit. But I wasn't producing then. I just was, you know what I'm saying, fucking with it. And then another thing was my uh, my stepdaddy, uh, little brother, Jared, he um was a DJ. So he used to DJ at East End Skate Ring and shit. So... He had virtual DJ the program, but he was, you know, like let us fuck with it and play with the the vinyl and shit like that. And um, I had fucked around and started doing a little virtual DJ shit, so I got familiar with, you know, mixing songs and mixing, BP, yeah. BPMs and shit like this. So eventually, you know, that all came together. So you self taught. You're self taught. Yeah. You taught yourself the keyboard. You taught yourself virtual DJ. That's hard. Yeah. So, in your other interview, I heard you say that you felt like the sign was when it was a shootout at your house and the keyboard got sh was the only thing that got hit. Like, yeah. you think that was a sign from God? Yeah, I still don't, I still don't really understand it now to this day, but I know for a fact um, my daddy was, because um, this one I moved with my daddy, so he was um, paying for me to take a... Uh, piano classes and um at guitar center mm. in, in memphis and um, i think it was like every other tuesday or some shit like that but he would take me up there and i because i didn't know how to play the, the piano or nothing and i still don't but he used to take me up there and the, um the dude who used to teach me had like a strong accent so i really couldn't um get it and i didn't want to keep wasting my dad the money it was like a hundred hundred dollars a month or some shit, but I know we ain't really just happy for him to be, you know, he was, but he was investing in me though. So, um, I just took that as a sign of, you know, me not really needing that shit. You know what I'm saying? So, cause I stopped doing it probably like after three months. 
But I tried. It just ain't work. And I took mm -hmm. that at the bullet, the, the the house getting shot up and shit is a sign maybe I ain't needed, which I really didn't at the end, you know. Yeah, you didn't. You found a whole other route. You yeah. don't always have to necessarily, you know, play the yeah. instrument. But do you play any instruments though? Yeah, I play. I know how to play. Like, I know to play the piano, but I don't know the keys. You right. know what I'm saying? So I don't, I wouldn't know like exactly which one are the keys or whatever, but I don't want to sound like no dumb nigga because that's how they gonna make the same. You not dumb. It's like it's like I know it by ear. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Oh, you play by I, ear. I play by ear. That's nowhere yeah. near dumb. It's yeah. harder actually to play by ear. Yeah. What was the first moment that inspired you to be a producer? Um, the first moment that inspired me was like when I actually made a beat the first time type of shit. It was a. Uh, I had already been, you know, making music and rapping and shit, but when I started putting it on YouTube and I started seeing like the acceleration of the attention that I was getting and shit like that, I kind of like knew that was what I needed to do. Like what made me want to be like, oh, I need to be damn near full time producer now. Putting out know? beats every day, yeah. Yeah, it was like a consistent um, weekly thing. Especially like it was from maybe like 15 to like 18 while I was actually putting beats on YouTube. And then when I had realized that I had a, a big enough name, I had started putting, um, I had created a whole different name, like a whole different producer brand for YouTube and started putting beats on there on YouTube through that. So what was that brand? I couldn't tell you. If I told you I had to kill you. What? <laughs> No, we're gonna we gonna talk about that off camera. I wanna know. <laughs> I definitely wanna know for sure. Yeah, but I, I, I had just basically created a whole nother um producer brand, mm -hmm. logos, you know, tags, all that. Like just whole different you know. It was crazy. You had the number one record in the world while still attending college. What made you keep going to school? Um but that was my last week of college when I got my number one record. But Sicko Mode had been out, I don't know, like a couple months, three, four months, some shit like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a big record at the time. It was, you know, my last semester in college, but I didn't think it was going to be a number one record. It just like how God lined it up for everything right. that just happened that way. So as far as like me having that record and it being a big record, um, besides it being number one, it was just like, well, I'm already this close with being done, you know, when from my first hit, uh, non-stop, I mean, uh, Look Alive and then non-stop, uh, that in between that, I had like January and December, maybe like 30 more credits. I mean, 30 more, cla uh, yeah, 30 more credits. So it was like, like, maybe like what it was? 10 more classes. Like, yeah, like yeah, I had like 10 more, like yeah, 10, like 10 more classes, some shit like that. So. I had to knock it out. It was like, why quit now? What was campus life for you like like during then? Um, It was fun, but it was also like me adjusting to the fact that I had fame because um, in my head, it was like I was, when those records first came out, I wasn't like a big, you know, like producer then. It was building up. So right. I remember me leaving class one day and I had got verified. You know what I'm saying? I had like 20K follows, some shit like that. But those were like, those moments where like everybody was knowing what was going on. But it was like, to me, I'm still trying to come up. So it yeah. wasn't never like me feeling like I was just a big producer until like the last couple of weeks when, you know, it I graduated in sickle mode, went number one. It was a moment that made me even a bigger producer. You get what I'm saying? Right. So when I graduated, that's when I feel like everything kind of like, Gradually, you know what I'm saying? What so were now, your friends' reactions like? Oh, um, so it's crazy because, like, my friends, like, we all was throwing parties. So it was like, it was just fun. That, you was a promoter? Yeah, I was promote. I was Swear. the DJ. I was the main DJ. Oh, like, that's hard. On campus. So I was DJing all the parties, too. So everybody already had that kind of, you know, they looked at me that same way already. Yeah, like you was already the nigga on campus. Yeah, and my niggas was too. Right. So we all were just lit. We would turn. It wasn't like, like, damn, this nigga. Because to this day, the niggas who I was coming up with, 
they look at me the same. It's not like I don't know, I don't booze you off for. I forgot about them. I'm the same person. Right. You know, and I think that's why I get a lot of respect because I never took none of this shit to the head. Like You stayed humble. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of producers mess up, but for sure. I think that's hard that you, you know, you stayed humble, you know, like you still have the relationship with your friends that you came up with college. Like a lot of people don't even talk to the people that they came up with anymore. Right. So how did it feel to have like all these accomplishments at the same time? Like you graduated college, number one record, like you verified, you going up, you're a super producer. How are you feeling? I think at the time it was hard for me to really uh, like appreciating and have gratitude towards a lot um of what was going on because i was um having problems at home with my mom you know um i said in uh, my last interview what uh, one of my recent interviews that my mom was um dealing with mental um issues so at the time it was just hard for me to just kind of like deal with that cope with that and enjoy the moment you know, so it kind of like made me get in this zone and just go even harder. So it wasn't about, you know, me celebrating this or doing that or doing this because I was hurt about a lot of things that happened. Like my mama couldn't make it to my graduation, you know, but it wasn't her fault. It was just like things that she she was she was battling with, you right. know. So um, in those moments, I really would say. I didn't appreciate it or my gratitude wasn't as strong as it is now about it. Then um, me learning and looking back on it and realizing like, you know, I could have, you know, appreciated those moments a little bit more. But at least you, you know, used it for motivation instead of like being knocked down and like, right. yeah. So that's good. I know your mom is proud of you for sure. Cause right. that's hard. It's really hard to get back up and keep doing that. Especially since I saw in your last interview, you said that she passed away like a few days after Dolph. So I know that was probably like a lot on you. Right. So what kept you, what kept you going? Um, my family, I got a strong family support. My auntie, which is my mama auntie. She really helped me through the whole process of the situation and what was going on from just like, my mama becoming like terminally ill too, you know, outside of like the 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 mental uh, issues. It was just like, my family was just always there for me. My mama's sister, um, they really just helped me and made me realize that I, if everything was gonna be okay and that I really had that family support because it was a lot of people who I really helped and watched out for and made sure that it was good that I feel like I didn't get that same support in return because of the situation when it came to my mom you know like a lot of people didn't a lot of people like i guess feel like they had other priorities and stuff but i i, I just remember like when my mom she always she always made sure and watched out for everybody else she did, she was like the backbone of the family she kept everybody together even through her hard times you know like it's just i i really appreciate like the family who was there for me because they helped me keep going all you really could do is appreciate who was there for you. And though I'm sure like the people who weren't there for you now, they're looking back like, damn, I kind of wish I was there, you know? Yeah. So what challenges did you face while being at college and producing? Um, passing classes, uh, the women, you know, they that's, were distracting that's, you? I mean, no, I was, I was distracting myself, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like a man weakness, you know, sometimes you know like temptation and stuff you just get so unfocused with a lot of things and you know i feel like i i grew to learn from you know things i've been through with women but when college i just felt like i i distracted myself through that um as far as the classes i really wasn't paying attention like i i should have i never got candidacy for the ram program which was my whole point oh, yeah, you know yeah. i just feel like you know I, I wish I would have focused more to get in those classes. And um, one of my advisors, it was a it was a black woman. Um, I really felt like she didn't go as hard for me to get in those classes like I wanted her to. You know, um, I just feel like I was in a dark space and I was talking to her about like, you know, what I had going on at home. And she was just like, um, I think she just advised me to go to like counseling or some shit. Um. But it was like, you know, I, I would expect for her, cause she had like this this woman. I remember she had a son or a daughter like my age too. Right. So, so you she know, she should have pushed for you. How she would push for them? Yeah, but 
you know, you can't expect it out of everybody. But I ended up getting another advisor. It was a dude, I wish I, I remember his name. But he don't work at the, at the school no more. I tried to look for him. But um, I appreciate him because he actually helped me. And, you know, it was like, it was like almost like me not being able to graduate and him pulling some strings, overriding some shit. Like, um, he really helped me for sure. No, I had an advisor like that. Those advisors are important. Like, right. that's, that's, those are the people that really leave impacts right. on your life. Yeah. And it was, it was like, you go into, you got to meet with them and you go into the meeting not knowing what, what your What's future hold, yeah. you know, and then you walking out like relief, like damn, okay, he did this for me, now I gotta go a little bit harder this semester. Yeah, you know I really wish, like, you know, as it's not many black teachers or advisors on campus, I wish your black advisor would have went harder for you. Right. But how did you end up balancing everything? Oh, uh, I feel like I don't want to sound bad saying it, but. I feel like I was just like, you know, doing like smoking and drinking a little bit, easing my mind, and yeah, I feel like it helped. You know, um, I definitely enjoyed myself partying too, so I felt like that was a way for me to, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it don't sound bad. It just sound like you lived your life. You was yeah, young. I was, I was, I was young. Yeah. I was, you know, enjoying it, so it was cool. You still party now, or you more chill? Yeah, I'm more chill now. now. I haven't. The way. Yeah, I haven't DJed in like two years, but I'm gonna eventually start back. No, no, you should. Yeah. You gonna DJ my next birthday party? We can see what's up. All right, yeah, man, cool. We can see. For sure. <laughs> I know that's gonna be a big ticket. <laughs> so, how were you treated as a student? Like, did professors know who you were? I I never wanted to have that advantage over. The other, you know what I'm saying? Students, students yeah. in the classroom, I feel like that's kind of fugazi. So, um, my professors never knew, never, from my understanding. Right. You know, I, I'm pretty sure at the time it, I, I didn't have situations where it'd be like students know me and have like them little fan moments in front of the, the professors, but yeah, I don't think they ever went and looked it up, like, yeah. you know, some shit. But I never, I never, they I always kept it, you know what I'm saying? Super P. Yeah, Super P. I ain't, <laughs> I went with all that shit. Nah, that's hard though. That's because a lot of people reach out for special treatment. So that's hard that you really like took your full, you know, and got your full experience. Like, mm -hmm. so did you gain any transferable skills from college and your degree that you use now as a producer? So my manner was media management. So I feel like when it came to just like, and Bam, um, my manager, Bam, his, his major was uh, marketing. So oh, that's perfect for y'all. Yeah, so I just feel like we just use that tool to the fullest. Like even yeah. now, like with this, I set this up. You know what I'm saying? Like I set it up with you know with the team, and you know it, it wasn't like I needed somebody band, to help. Yeah, yeah, no PR person or you know it, I just know this shit. You know, you know what I'm saying? I know how to handle the business. So I feel like that's a skill that I learned that I still use now. You know, I'm very hands on with a lot of shit, like from the graphics. Like I know how to fuck with graphics and shit because I told you I used to draw. Oh, yeah. So I used for I started on Photoshop young too. Oh, so you okay? You yeah, really so knowing stuff. Yeah, I used to make flyers for the parties and all that. Like that's wrong. Yeah. No, because you need those skills as a producer. So like, would you tell younger producers that it's important to go to college? Because a lot of people think like because there's so many successful people without right. going to school, they think that school is not necessary anymore. That's a good question. I would say. So I'm gonna speak from a pr producer standpoint. Um, me, I'm a producer who I can get in the rooms with these artists and vibe with them, and you know we pop out whatever. Like it's right. I'm, like I'm a regular nigga like them. Like they don't look at look belittle me, you know. But I also built that up. So when it comes to producers who want to build to that point, I feel like you got to be sociable. That's what college gonna get you know give you like being in the mix. Like even if you feel like you not a people's person. When you get to college, you get in these organizations, you know, um, like I did Collegiate 100. So, I swear. Yeah, I did That's Collegiate. raw as hell. Yeah, so I did Collegiate 100 where uh, actually a lot of people who I did it with are like, I'm still cool with and work with today, like Tyler, my uh, stylist. So he did oh. Collegiate 100 with me. So um, that's a perfect example because, you know, I built with him. You know, he was there before all this shit, just like Bam was. So we built up together, you know, so. Um, being on campus, socialize again in the organizations, you know. Um, and I went to a PWI, I ain't go to a HBCU, but it still was 
I made, you know, when I was DJing and throwing the parties, I brought that vibe to MTSU. Right. You but know? you you literally absorbed everything on campus and you were actually like involved. A lot of people go to college and they don't get involved. You so have that's to like, though. Yeah. That's, I feel like that's where you really get your best skills and your knowledge. Right. But people don't understand that. They think you just go in these classes and that's where you're supposed to get everything. Right. But no, it's the whole experience. That's where you get your knowledge. That's where you learn all of that. Exactly. So is it true that you're a professor now? Yeah, the honorary professor. Oh, that's hard. So yeah. how did that come about? Um, Nick, so my homeboy Nick, he graduated from MTSU too. So mm -hmm. he helped with a lot of my PR sh uh, shit. And basically over the years, he had built a relationship uh, with the the deans and the president of MTSU. And, you know, we did a lot of means. And, you know, I just kind of like stayed hands on with the university even when we graduated. So... You know, we just um, kind of came up with an idea because I initially wanted the honorary uh, doctorate, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can still you can still get that, can't you? Yeah, but it's since uh, MTSU is state university, you can't. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So we was like, well, we can do the honorary professorship, and you know, see what come with it. So um, now I'm I'm in the process now where I'm gonna go to MTSU and uh, talk to. The students. Um, I got a couple students' name already in my notes that I'ma that I ran into outside of school. Mm -hmm. That I'ma um, make sure they be in the class and shit like that. Oh, so you're getting a whole class, a whole class. No, nah, no, nah, it's just gonna be me coming, speaking. Oh. You know, they professor might quiz them on some. You know, yeah. I assume that that that's what they want to do. But um, you know, just go talk to the the students and give them motivation, answer some questions for them, and you know, give them the inspiration. What do you think about putting like your own org at uh, your college? That's like, a lot of responsibility. Um, that that could be something that I, I definitely work could, on, in, yeah, the work on yeah. in the future. For I sure. think that'd be hard because there's no like people don't really teach producing. Right. Everybody's really self-taught. Self I feel but like I that'd, be, that'd be that will be a good place. Like act awesome. actually in the hip hop industry producing. Yeah. You know, because I'm pretty sure it's music that production that classes, places, yeah. but Hip hop it's, industry. So how did you mix your manager band? How did that come about? Um, so we we locked in at college, but we had already knew each other for years, like around like like I said, Memphis Small. So my niggas was his niggas, you know what I'm saying? Or I knew people he was real close with, you know, vice versa. We right. just was all locked in, like his cousin was real close to my brothers. So like, you know, everything was just locked in when we got to MTSU. Um I was there a year before him, but we only a couple months apart, so his birthday uh, late, so he got there the year after me. So when he uh, came, I was like, bro, you need to go on and come throw parties with me and shit, you know, so put him in a mix with that because, you know, he was already had his, you know, reputation going and shit too, right. so. He was like one of your first college friends. Yeah. Well, yeah, kind of, sort of, yeah, because it was my sophomore year, so I had already had some yeah. friends, but like technically, like yeah, my still, young, yeah. yeah, it was like, you know, my like the younger class. Yeah, yeah, that's how it is though. I always hung out with the older kids too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, are you ready for this? I don't know. Okay, so I need you to give me two story times, your favorite session, uh -huh. and then like your most awkward session. I got a lot of favorite sessions, but one of my most favorite sessions would be, um, I would say, with Travis Scott. When we did like maybe like I don't know how many songs, but we was there all day. I was tired as hell. I was ready to go, but I still was cooking up and shit. Like, um, and it was it was like we had went through all the beats and like none of them joints. Then I had the last one. I was cooking up. He came back in that joint. He's like, load that motherfucker up right now. Like, oh wow, that's crazy. Yeah, he went right in on that joint. But that was like one of my favorite sessions because I really had worked hard. Like, I, back, I had made like 15 beats. I was there all day cooking up, like, Damn. just waiting to, you know, him to catch on or something. But when he heard that junk, he came right in that motherfucker game. You know what I'm saying? I heard Travis bring the vibes though. What's his sessions like? Um, I mean, shit, it's, it's like every other creative artist, you know? He just come in there, cook up, vibe out, you know what I'm saying? Always good energy. Does what was the what would you say the next question was the the most awkward? Yeah, the most awkward session. Uh, 
I had an awkward moment with Wiz because it was awkward on me because um mm-hmm. I had a bad habit of smoking like blacks. So oh, and I had a, like and it was my first it was my first session like in LA, like real session in LA. And um he was just so he was just such a, a good energy nigga. And I was like, he was like, man, you you smoke? He was like, cause he had some weed. He was like, man, you want some? I was like, nah, I had a black. He was like, man, black. <laughs> You can't be smoking that shit. Like, you can't be. And I just feel so bad. I'm like, damn, it's Wiz Khalifa telling me don't smoke blacks. Like, but I stopped a year after that though. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but it was just like awkward as hell for me. I'm like, damn, this Wiz Khalifa telling me this shit. Like, At least he ain't Jonesy, you know? Yeah. He could have been worse. He he looked out for you. Just yeah, let you know, don't like, do that. Yeah, he was like, nah, don't do that. But I stopped this shit though. So, who's some of your favorite artists to work with? Um, like I said, Travis Scott, Drake, um. I know it's so many, but you yeah, know, it's like so many. Uh, Little baby, money bag for sure, money bag, black youngster. Um, yeah, that was that, and that's another artist like with well, black youngster. Like he just make everything so fun when you be around, bro. Like <laughs> he, he he's just is a, a vibe. fun <laughs> ass nigga. Funny. Like when we in the studio, like and he was one of the niggas who really like showed me, you know, like in, industry shit for the first time, like. Saying a Lamborghini like in front of me, like in that motherfucker, like a Rolex bust down, mm-hmm. like fifty thousand in cash. You know what I'm saying? He yeah. really showed me that shit. Like I seen it, I visualized it. Like you know what I'm saying? He but, played a big part in like your early on career. Hey, yeah, but like, y'all still like he for sure. That because he because he gave me so much inspiration. I remember one time he asked me, um, uh, where you where you see yourself uh being or how big you see yourself getting with the producer. And I was like, I want to be big as Metro. You know, and this was before, um, you know, like I had like I had like a buzz, but I went a big producer year, and I was like, I see my le- myself getting up to like that top tier level, basically to sum it up. And you know, he really just gave me encouragement and helped me get to that point. Like that's hard. Yeah, yeah. So, what's like the best advice that you've ever received from an artist? Um, speaking of black youngsters, one of the best things that I took heed to. That he talked because he put me on a lot of game. But one of the best things uh, I took heed to was he was like, if you don't like a nigga, don't never tell nobody. Like, don't ever tell that to somebody. Like, if you're going to tell it to anybody, tell it to him. You know, mm-hmm. because it's like you could tell somebody that you don't like them or you don't fuck with them or this person. And then you never know. They might be cool with this person and it might be a move for you to make through them somewhere he gatekeeping from you making a move because you, you know what I'm saying, said like you don't him, fuck yeah. with him. Like, not knowing that he really fuck with the nigga you said you don't fuck with. So, that's on that. Like, and, you know, me, I got a good record in the, in the industry. Like, no fuck shit, no flaws. Like, yeah, you do. I got all good relationships. So, it be dumb situations where somebody might, I might have felt disrespected or it might have been some little fuck shit that I let, all right, cool, whatever. I know that I can't really fuck with you, but I'm gonna keep it at that. I ain't finna go bashing you or talk it down on you because right. I might miss my own blessing. So you just keep cool. Yeah, like mm-hmm. the game rotating doors. You know what I'm saying? You're also known for like handling your business very, very well. What advice can you give to young producers to make sure that their business is handled well? Um, A business manager, a manager, and a lawyer. Mm, you're gonna be out of like 25 percent of your money but it's gonna make you then a 250 times that you know what i'm saying like so it's like me i make the sacrifice of paying my manager and my lawyer and my business manager you know when i make certain plays or you know out of percentages on this or monthly you know and it's like that's what it it take but i i had read a comment where the producer was like um how we don't get no how we gonna get a lawyer when we don't have no money. But I didn't have no money when I found my lawyer. You know, I was broke. Right. I had money but not enough to pay for an attorney. So I wanted to let it be known that most attorneys, good attorneys, um won't trip about a retainer. They'll you know? work with you until they know that you yeah. get to that level. Yeah. Sure. So if if you come at a, a lawyer saying like I got this big placement with um, Gucci, or I got this big placement with whoever, you know, and they know you gonna get some type of fee or percentage or something. 
they might say, all right, well, just give me 20%, you know, 10%, yeah. whatever, you know, you're going to get. And that'll be the fee. And now you got a relationship. Now you got a lawyer. Yeah, you, you got, got a relationship. relationship. You know, instead of it being like, damn, I ain't got $2,500 for a retainer, you know. But that's the thing about people giving up too easily, you know. Yeah. They don't try to find ways around it. So, speaking of business, what are some business ventures that you, you know, went into after, you know, you were kind of like settled, you got your money? Um, A couple um business moves I've been making um besides real estate um cuz that's one of one thing that I did when I first got my first big check I bought my house well I bought the house that my family stay in cash cuz I knew it was going to be worth the investment worth way you know? more, yeah so um I, I bought the house cash um then I started buying other properties and shit in Memphis I got tenants staying in them and families and shit that I don't charge. I just charge, you know, base rent, whatever, it, you know what I'm saying? It is. I got companies managing it, so I don't really get into it, but I'm not overcharging nothing for rent. Um, but the the properties are built on equity, you know, like right. they're building, like they, the, the price is going up, they appreciate. So um, besides that, I, um, I did uh, a couple startup investments. So, um, one of the main ones is um, Path Water. So y'all gonna see about that. Um, There's a lot of people invested in it. A lot of big names y'all gonna see too, but Path Water is um, basically a company where it's like recycled material and water, like so. And um, mm -hmm. it's like in, it's like in um, certain Walgreens and CVS um, and stores like that right now, but it's gonna be everywhere soon. That's and they dope. also got like, um, Water bottle is dedicated to uh, children brands like SpongeBob and you know shit like that. Uh, and another company is Earthrise, so it's basically like um, ride share, but all electric cars. So mm -hmm. that's gonna be big. Yeah, know? I see a lot of people like reaching into electric cars. Like even on Uber, they got this feature now, like Comfort Electric. Like, right. yeah. So I that's think... dope that you got into that early, you know. Right. So I saw it was your birthday the other day. Happy birthday, by the way. I appreciate it. Of course, you accomplished so much at such a young age. How do you deal with all the success that you're receiving? Uh, so, so as far as me dealing with the success, like mentally, uh, you know, I feel like um, for one, everybody should do therapy. Everybody should try therapy or some type of therapy, you know, meditation, whatever, yoga, whatever you feel like, you know, could be your outsource. So, you know, I've been doing it. Um, I, I always take morning jogs, you know, at the park on some chill shit. Um, I travel a lot. I like to sightsee. I'm very big on, on sightseeing. Like, like I, I might see a, a a city, a town, or something on TV or something, and I might get to doing go in a spiral, doing Google researches on it and looking it up, and then I go there. You go visit. You know, yeah. like I just like doing that, especially like when I'm in big cities. I like to, you know, go to different restaurants and. Try new things. Yeah, try new things, go shopping, like especially like the beach. I love going to the beach. Really? I always go to um when I'm in Miami, I always be in like South Mid Beach area at the at the hotel, just chilling, feet kicked back. I can be there five, six hours. You just know, the chilling, whole yeah. just the whole day just chilling. Yeah. But that's so, what it, that's that's how I feel like I personally deal with it like on a mental level because it could get it, it can get draining sometimes. And you might get beat blocked or you might get burnt out or mm -hmm. you just might feel like you, ain't, you know, you, you hard on yourself. But you you got to me personally. I feel like those the type of things that I do to bring me back. Have you ever got producer's block? Not really. Um, Sometimes you, you might get it like when it comes to you being in the studio with an artist and it's kind of like hard to you know, get in, get a, get a, get a song or something like a beat that the artist want to make a song to or something, or they might be like change it or, you know, whatever. In that instance, I, I might feel like, yeah, sometimes it can be a little challenging, but in that case, I just like, I got producers who make loops. I'd be like, send me some of this shit, send me some of that, like, hurry up, make a pack. You know, so it's going to be, yeah, it can be like a, you know, a quick move to make. So Dre, Neptune, Kanye, 
are producers that have been named like the best producers. How does it feel for your name to be up there amongst those names at such a young age? It felt good because I, I feel like I wasn't even, I, I ain't gonna say I didn't deserve it, but I feel like I was just so new in the game where I feel like I still had a lot to prove. And you know, when I was named their producer, it was before a lot of my- 2018. Even, yeah, it was, a lot, it was before a lot of my bigger records. You know what I mean? Out. It was like, um, I think I had um, like nonstop sick on mode, look alive, but then outside of those records, I don't think it wasn't too many big records that I had. So at the time, I feel like you know I really had to work a little bit harder to live up to it, you know. Right. But now I'm at 29 certified um, records. So what are three of your goals before the end of the year? Um, I hopefully. My next goal is to get Grammy nominated in the next That's year. Soon. Yeah, so, I, well, I got Grammy nominated already, but that was, you know, my first year in the game. So I want to get Grammy nominated again. Hopefully um, I win next year, but that's a goal by the end of this year. Um, another number one. Coming. On another the way. number one. You know, I really manifested getting another, my second number one. But I feel like another one is going to be, you know, a big moment for me also. Um, getting a certified record with one of my producers, you know, like a platinum record. So um, I did rumors with Meech, DJ Meech, and it went gold. So hopefully by the end of this year, it'd be platinum. You know, that'll be a big moment. That'll be hard. Yeah. So you believe in manifestation? Yeah, 100%. It's so real because I always go back to the artist's that I always, you know, admired and wanted to work with, I ended up working with him. It's crazy, like how God in the universe, like positioned that shit that mm -hmm. really happened. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. I couldn't even wrap my mind around it, you know, sometimes. But do you ever write out your goals? Yeah, I write them out. I just want to tell them on the camera. No, for sure. <laughs> I'll be doing them. that too. That's why. Cause, cause you know, <laughs> I gotta ask. I'll be doing that. You know, if you, if you. You know how I go. No, for sure. I feel like if you speak on it, then you know, you yeah. kind of fuck up your plate. But yeah. Sometimes, yeah, but you know, my real goals that I have, I feel like I got to keep them to myself. Yeah, like, you definitely got to keep them to yourself until yeah. you achieve them. And then you'd be like, yeah, that was one of my goals. Yeah. So tell us more about your label. Like, what producers do you have over there? What's your goals for your label? How did it come about? Um. So I have, Um. I'm actually in the process of signing more producers right now, but, um, I got Bam Boy, um, The Narrow Love, um, Grayson, uh, Grayson Beats. That's why I just did uh, the new Nav and Travis record with. Oh, that's hard. Um, damn, DJ Meech, me, shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Saying to myself, um, who else? It's a couple more that I'm I'm in a process of uh, signing Sorry. now. I'm gonna make it a you know announcement. Then it'll be a big moment for sure. So I wanna, you know. So what do you look for in the producers that you sign in? Just in case there's anybody out there that's you know interested. I'm sure it's a um, lot of people interested. Yeah, I had just said um, in like this podcast idea as far as um, me having people who I sign work harder than me. Cause it motivates me. Right. It makes me want to go harder because it's like I see how hungry they is, and it kind of put me in that mindset of where I started from and where how I got to where I'm at. So I be one niggas who I sign to just work and send me shit or you know send it off or whatever and get placements on their own and me also doing working my move. But I feel like the harder they go, it make me go harder. So that's what I look for in a producer: the ambition, the determination. The hustle. That's dope. So yeah. what's like the process? Like how you how you picking them? Oh, uh, it just it ain't it ain't how I'm picking them. It's just more about the relationships built with with me, like working with with them, like outside of me signing them, like getting placements with them, and he was sending me um, beats, and one of the beats I had got. Uh, Roddy on, Roddy Rich on. The song ain't came out yet, but I'm like, man, I need to sign this nigga. Like, you know, he 
New York. Yeah, he hard. You know, obviously he had something, to, you know. Oh, so okay. I ended up on um, just like getting into the talks with him and seeing what he wanted to do and where his mindset was in. And, you know, from that point on, I was like, you know, we need to make it official and sign him and bring him on the team. And, you know, we just started linking, going to L.A. together and working and putting him in sessions and bam, got a lot of hands on with him. And, you know, we just went from there. That's dope. Yeah. So for a younger producer that want to work with you, how should they reach out to you? Um, Cause I, I know that like the thing now with a lot of producers, they send in loops like crazy. Yeah, that's but loop it's, makers in style right now. Yeah, but it's also like, you, you gotta understand uh, the the importance of relationship over being an opportunist. Right. You know, um, so when, when producers be sending me loops and shit, like I look at it like, all right, do they follow me? You know, have they been trying to get in contact with me? You know, or is this just something they just say, oh, I want to send take keys from Loops and, you know, uh, DM me a link that they just made out the blue, you know, right. because I say that because when it comes to getting a placement with these producers, I don't be knowing them, you know, and I ain't no telling they, they their intentions. Like, it might be a big record and, man, they might get to talking crazy. And mm -hmm. I might be like, bro, you're not getting this amount of money for this beat because I got a relationship with this artist. Like, right. you gonna, you know, fuck it Play up. Play your role. Yeah, so, um, I'm, I look for like, you know, loop makers and producers who want to be, um. Actually lock in. Yeah, lock in and build, you know, and, you know, just show love. Cause I'm the type of person I always show love. I never been the type of nigga to gatekeep or hold my nuts on niggas or, you know what I'm saying? No, like, for sure, yeah. So I like to show love, man. When it when it when it be shit that's not genuine, with, and I find out in the long run, it it be bothering me, you know, because I feel like I put so much into it, so much, you know what I'm saying? Like, shit be crazy. What's your sign? I'm a Virgo. I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> My brother's a Virgo. So <laughs> I, I I like I look into like producers being genuine, with, you know, that I really want to fuck with and build with them, man. It's a lot of producers who. I got placements with, like big placements with that I talk to all the time. Right. You know, just phone call, you know, what's good, bro? FaceTime, you know, that might make their day, it might make mine, you know? So how can you tell the difference between an opportunist and a producer that's really like trying to actually work with you, lock in? If a producer showing love, like, you know, it can be hit me up, you know, tell him like my birthday, like happy birthday, bro. You know yeah. what I'm saying? like. Post me or whatever, like here you go, birthday shout out. You know, I, I take that as like it really fuck with me, cause you know how it be. You be on like Instagram or social media, you just see somebody's birthday, you just like fuck them. But yeah. then they might hit me up next week trying to send me some loops. Yeah. It's like That's you know, I expect you to be. I ain't gonna say it's lame. It's just like show that it ain't. You I know, think genuine. it's lame because it's not genuine. That's why I feel yeah. like it's lame because it's not genuine. I, I mean, that, like... that's cool for producers to wanna you know, be like that, but I'm speaking on as far as building with producers like me where they be able to have that, you know, type of understanding where they can just be more genuine, you right. know what I'm saying? Because it, it might work for other producers to like send them out the blue hard ass loops and shit, but I done been in situations where producers pull certain moves where it make me like, No, nah. and a lot, of, a lot of producers are facing that now, you know? Because the loop makers, they get like, when it's time to handle the business, they just be fucking shit up. So yeah. it's, I think it's important that you actually take the time to determine whether they're opportunists or actually just, you know, somebody that's trying to work and lock in. Right. That's going to be the difference between you having to deal with it later on down the line versus y'all actually building a good relationship right. and could potentially get signed. So what's your way of giving back and educating the producer community? Um, I got a uh, Discord. So I ain't been active on it um, recently. Yeah, so like the producers in my Discord who really involved and, you know, um, be hitting me up and shit. I be talking to them all the time, giving them the game, collabing with them, getting yeah, them right. placements and shit like this. So that's something that I feel like I really like do to like give back and show like their personal side of me outside of like what motherfuckers might see or, you on know. On the internet, yeah. yeah. Do you ever get on Twitch? Oh, I started. I tried to do Twitch. I just was kind of like confused a little bit. I a need to get more. Say that, yeah. I need to get like I. I need to try it again. But Twitch is actually a real. I think it's a dope uh, net platform. Like I even use it for my beat battles. Like yeah, because it's real wild. Like 
people were that couldn't make it like they were watching it from you know other places like everywhere they were able to watch it and then like a lot of producers are making money off of this platform so right. i think yeah i think you should reach out to twitch just try to see if like you could mm -hmm. yeah and uh, another thing i say i was doing is um instagram live i'm gonna I'm a really do it again but um I have lives on, on my label page or my page where I let people come on and play their beats and play their, you know, songs and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I feel like that they give people that platform to be heard, you know. Yeah, that's dope. I mean, you can do that on Twitch too. Do you think it's important for people outside of the producer community to give recognition to producers like how they give recognition to artists? Yeah, I think that's um, important. And it's, it's kind of been like a trend lately and I, I would say like in the past few years with like the producer, the big producer tags, you know, they've kind of been like what people have been, you know, um, kind of like making a big moment around. Right. Um, and I see like a lot of, um, a lot of places like Double XL or Complex or whatever, they, they kind of like give producer their recognition, like tag the hottest producer or you know uh the what producer you think could make the hit with you know what i'm saying this or whatever they be doing and it bring a lot of attention to like the producer community for sure and um also what y'all be doing too you know especially like the up the platform where it's like a lot of more up becoming producers i didn't met or found out about through y'all platform you know really that's yeah. dope so do you think that producers are getting more recognition now than like back in the day yeah, I think it was it was more um of a move where if you was a produ a big producer back in the day, you were also a artist too. Right. You know, you also did vocals or hooks or whatever. You know, like Timberland or Pharrell. You know what I'm saying? Like they was those big producers, but they also did songs too, like the big face, uh, top tier producers then. So right. now it's like producers are more chill like the big producers are more chill in the cut you know it's, it's more about like the fashion statement or it's more about um the interviews or it's more about like um i guess the variety of artists you're working with too so yeah so is it true that you're only doing like limited interviews who said that that's just what i heard like that you're not really trying to do no interviews who told you that that's just what they say I mean, who is they man that's, <laughs> that's what they say in the street who is that yeah. that's I, not true at the I, I think at the time it was like um i went in a, i went in a, a good space to do interviews um i just matured um kind of been doing like a lot of healing from grieving and shit, where I can be in a space where I feel comfortable enough to talk, talk on the camera. It. And it'll be, it wouldn't even be the fact that I couldn't talk on the cameras or whatnot. It'll just be like my anxiety that's kicking my ass. I got bad anxiety, I know how to Yeah, that. it's just so, now um, I'm in a place now where I'm not taking social media as serious as I did. You know, I ain't never been the type of person, like even when I was coming up and I had to remind myself when I go back to my old, posts and pictures and tweets and shit like how much I didn't give a fuck and it worked for me <laughs> but it's like me being in that mindset of just being myself up or judging myself or you know criticizing myself so much for what I post and what I do now it's like I feel more comfortable just like letting, be yourself, yeah being yeah. myself and not even you know thinking too hard about yeah, it. Yeah these people don't know you outside of social media be yourself. Yeah. I just felt like life was too short for you to live by any else anybody else's rules right. like you gotta be yourself. Right. I think it's it's like it's just how the shit kind of set up now where it's like you got to kind of like limit yourself. You shouldn't be able to like express yourself all the way 100 percent because it's so opinionated now. Yeah. You know. And I, I think that sucks, too, because there's a lot of people that like be giving comments on stuff that they don't even know about just because it's on the Internet. They feel like they have the right to, but like right. you don't, you know. Yes. But that's why you really, like you said, you just gotta not give a fuck. Cause like, I don't even know you. So who gives a fuck what you say? Like nothing you say should even matter to me. You know what I'm saying? What helped you build your brand and be like recognizable as a producer? Um, uh, My hair, like this right here. For real? Like that really helped. I mean, shit, you know, there's a lot of people <laughs> know me because of, because of my hair. Like just cause I always had the, 
the the shit at the top, the man bun at the top, whatever motherfucker want to call it, shit. <laughs> I think it is called a man bun. Yeah, I just always had it at the top of my head, so it kind of was like one of them things where people knew me being take keep the chubby nigga with the the, the dreads at the top of his head. You know what I'm saying? So um, outside of that, um, my tag for sure. Um, shout out to Lil Juice for the tag. I was definitely gonna ask that. Yeah. I love asking about tags. Yeah. Um, I tell I tell every interview that he the one made my tag. We did it like 2017. I gave him a couple beats for the swap for the tag. You know. Oh, so it was on purpose. It was an accident. Yeah, because I had tweeted that I needed a tag. So he was like, if you, however the conversation went, um, I think it was like a swap for the. The beats you get and, some beats, you do my yeah. tag. That's but I still fuck with him now, you know, yeah. make sure, you know, he's straight when he talk to me, like, you know, um, it's just like, he he working on his music thing too, you know, so he for sure got his own shit going. So I just, That's whenever so whenever he he need me, I make sure I get him beats and, you know, whatever it might be, so. No, but that's real that you still like, even look out for him yeah. at this point in your career. Like, that's hard. So where did your producer name come from? Like where did Take Keep come from? Lakeith, my middle name. Oh. Um, because my uncle, my mama uncle, name his name is Keith, and then my auntie, my mama sister, her name Lakeitha. So I guess she just put it together, Lakeith. So I took Tay from my first name and Keith and put it together. I mean, I named myself in like eighth grade. Oh, you've been calling yourself Tay Keith since eighth grade. Eighth grade, yep. That's hard. What's your real name? <laughs> What's your first name? But I've, I've been doing it for shit, damn that what it's been. Cause I'm 26, I did that shit like when I was 12 or 13, so. Yeah, that was. A long was time. Really, yeah. Yeah. So how important do you think it is for producers to invest in themselves financially? Like, is it about the talent or the equipment? Is it about both? What do you um, think? Both. Um. It depends on what you're saying when you're saying equipment too, because me personally, I just needed a good laptop. You know, most producers might feel like they need, you know, this machine, you know, whatever, MPC, you know, keyboard. I just needed a good ass laptop and the programs, you buy the programs, you know. And your so, talent. Your talent, you know. So if you wanna, if you feel the need to go take piano classes or, you know, go take some college courses or whatever, that's cool, you know. I feel like that's investing in yourself. It is investing in yourself for sure. So have you ever had a beat that you personally like, you didn't like it yourself, but it became a hit? Um, I feel like I ain't like the Soul Ice and Boys 2 beat. Stop it. I ain't really like that beat. I was just talking about that song in the car with JB and Scar the other day. Yeah. And I love that song. I ain't think it was because I did not expect there to be no hit. Like, I what? did not know it was going to go gold. Like, it was just unexpected. That is so crazy. Yeah. Wow. I love that beat. But it's though. crazy because I had originally made that beat for Ghana. Oh, wow. Yeah, I made that beat for Ghana. Um, I had did it with, um, I think, uh, this producer called uh, Nadra. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, uh, he a big loop maker, but I think I made it with him, if I'm mistaken. And then I sent it to Ghana. I made a pack for Ghana, played him the pack or whatever, and she, he liked that one. But he got some, he rapped, he had rapped on some other beats, but out of that pack, the the beats that was in it, I was like, shit, let me, you know, see what who else was on it. Yeah. yeah, so I didn't think it was going to be no hit, though. Are there any producers that you look up to and or want to work with and like who and why? You know, that's a good question because I always forget when when I do interviews, I always forget the, the, the producers who I really, it's so many of them that really inspire me and help me get to this point without like, but like, of course, like the Memphis producers, Drama, Squeaky, Memphis, Trey Boy, I say them in every interview because I want people to know. That's the the Memphis sound is that is the Memphis sound. That is the Memphis sound. You know what I'm saying? It's just all of us got our own branches of the Memphis sound. You yeah. know, and um them three. Um of course like Metro, uh Lace Lugo, Southside, Young Chop, uh Templin Pharrell, uh TM eighty eight, uh 
the list goes on. Murder beats. Uh, damn, it's so many of them. I see. I always forget. I should have been prepared for that. But <laughs> like, um, the list goes on though. You know, yeah. Honorable C Note. You know, I feel like he definitely was one of those producers that like had his own distinct sound. Yeah. And was. I respected it because he stuck to it, and you know, he he known for that type of shit. So. What about an upcoming producer? Like, who's an upcoming producer that you really like? Like, you heard about them, you seen them on Instagram, like, you really fucking with them, you want to work with them? Uh, it's a couple on that I'm fucking with. I'm fucking with uh, DB, DB Beats. I think that's you gotta lock like in with him. Yeah, yeah he that hard nigga, as fuck. That nigga hard as fuck. I fuck with him. Um, like, as far as big producers, you know, I'm pretty much locked in with everybody. You know, yeah. we all locked yeah, in. All came like, up together, yeah. yeah, like, especially like, um, Murder, Jason, ATL, Jacob, Pooh, uh, Turbo. Like, mm -hmm. we all, like, we really Locked be in, kicking yeah. it. Like, fuck the music shit. Like, them <laughs> my niggas. Like, we all just, we, you know what I'm saying? Pull up, whatever. Like, we doing it. Like, we enjoying it, having fun. Like, just big, the big top tier producers, really, outside of the music. We just vibe together. You know, we like, just always. Like, really be kicking it, yeah. Yeah, going out to eat, pulling up, wherever. You know what I'm saying? Miami, going to the club, LA, popping out. We just always linking up. It's always a fun time, always a vibe. Cause it's like, we don't never, it ain't no competition with us. We all in our own lane. We all got our own sound. It's like all love, all genuine. I fuck with all they producers, all, they, you know, they fuck with all my producers. It's just like all genuine love. Like every nigga who Turbo got signed or Jason got signed or Murder got signed. I use they loops just like they do for the same with my producer. You know right. what I'm saying? It's all James with love. I wish like the younger producers would get that. I feel like they're starting like competition between each other and it's like gonna break apart the producer community. Like everybody gotta come together and realize like it's not competition shit. It's enough yeah. room for everybody to eat. It's enough room because niggas in the studio every day. Yeah. We so all in our different lane, yeah. got our own. We all broke artists with, you know, and we got songs together, hits together and shit too. Right. So it's like we all. In our own lane, it's never been no competition. Like, I don't even look at them niggas like that. It's always been love. It ain't never been no fool shit. You know what I'm saying? And that's the right way to go. Hey, yeah. What is, like, the biggest obstacle you faced, like, from the beginning of your career to, like, now? Um, The biggest obstacle I faced probably been, um, like, dealing with music. Um... I would say just knowing what, what your next hit gonna be. Mm, that's, that's a big one. you know, shit. Who was there who said that? I think Two Chainz said like, you know, when you get a big hit, you know, that that's when you really get nervous or you know your your anxiety or whatever might fuck with you because you like, damn, I gotta follow up with another one. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a moment now, but it's like, you know. So I feel like after this one, after that one, after this one, after that one, it been twenty some times where I feel like shit. I gotta make it to the 30th time now, you know, so um, I feel like me having this moment this year kind of like eased it up a little bit for me. Just like having so many big records back to back from the beginning of the year to now, so it's kind of like eased it. But I know when this moment is over, I know I'm gonna feel it again. I'm gonna be hard on myself like, come on, bro, I gotta lock in, I gotta get this done, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, you know. But if you're working every day, then I think, like, you shouldn't even worry about it because it's going to come to you. Yeah, it's just, it's just the universe and how this shit, how God, you know, like, I guess, test your faith. Mm -hmm. so. But God always got bigger plans for us, so, you know, you right. just got to trust that. Right. So, throughout this journey, what would you say was your biggest key to success? My biggest key to my success, personally, was the consistency. You know, consistency in my sound, which, ironically, now is kind of like the thing where I get criticized the most for in my career you know a lot of people kind of criticize me for having a similar sound but it's like that's what got me here that's what blessed my family that's what you know what i'm saying got me to buy my mom their house or my daddy their house or invest in my family business or you know what i'm saying pay for college and you know just being the where i'm at in my career all in general that's what got me here yeah. being consistent with my sound so you know i can take the criticism for that because it's the perfect balance in the world that's how i go if it's not broke don't fix it yeah so you know um me being consistent with my sound and creating it made a lane for me and myself and you know it's just like been working for me and of course like you know i let it get to me sometimes but for the most part like i know in the back of my head that's where I, 
got me where I'm at, so shit, you know, it's gonna stay that way. For sure. So now we're gonna get to Tweet Talk, which is our new segment, where I'm gonna mention some recent tweets from other producers, including some of your tweets, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna just get your opinion on them, like whether you agree with them or you disagree. Yeah. So, I saw your tweet on Producer Culture the other day saying, I produced some of the biggest songs of the year. I need to win a Grammy this time. Mm -hmm. What would it mean if you won a Grammy? Like, does a Grammy automatically like enroll you to GOAT status? Like, how you feel? About yeah, a Grammy. I feel like it does. Um, not necessarily, but it's an achievement that I want for sure. Um, I feel like that's where you want you would want to work hard for in the you know the music industry. That's the ultimate trophy, literally. You know, right. so that's what one I of them hard trophies. Yeah, yeah. So let's go, Hayes tweeted. Can you have a successful career as a music producer if you only create beats using loops and samples? How do you feel about that? If you basically saying you're a loop maker or you saying like you're a producer that only uses those samples. And I think it's saying, I think he meant if you only use beats like as a like as a producer, you only use loops and samples to make beats like you're not starting from scratch. I think that's what he meant. Um, not necessarily. You know, um, I feel like a lot of my records are mine, just 100 percent me. But a lot of my records also have loops in them too, my big records. So, you know, it just depends. It's a balance. So DJ Payne said, a loop maker I don't know flooded my inbox with several emails with 11 attachments each. Mm -hmm. They were all unclear samples he just looped. He demanded 50%. The subject line was fire loops for big placements. He did not disclose the samples weren't original. Things are bad. How do you feel about that? Man, that's, that's like the ultimate argument right now in the producer community because the the producers who you know are getting these loops from the loop makers feel like the loop makers are feeling entitled to get 50 percent but it's right. also like the loop makers have to understand that when it comes to getting a placement with an artist that's off of the artist relationship and it's it's like the artist can't just rap can't he rap or artist can't rap on just the loop but it needs some drums on it too, or whatever. It needs or it. It it, need to be you know, it needs to be complete. So, I think it, it's all about the understanding up front. Is which something that I've been doing with loop makers. Like if it is random loop makers that I uh, get loose from, and I just so happen to fuck with them, I make sure I, I let them know. Like if there's any other loops, bro, on it, you know, make sure you split that with on your end. You know right. what I'm saying? But I always do fur business anyway. It ain't like I'm pulling fuck moves or no, whatever. Sure. So I feel like just have it understood when you listen to the loops. If not, she just block that email. Yeah, I feel like the easiest way to deal with loop makers is just, you know, like you said, start from the beginning, mm -hmm. make it clear what it's going to be. And then I feel like from there forward, you shouldn't have no problems. And, then, and if you really like the loops, you know, buy with the loop maker for two weeks or so and sign them. Right. See where he's at. Lock know, in with him. Lock in with him, yeah. So I saw Bolo say, if I didn't get the beat, the song wouldn't have got placed. How do you feel about that? He said, if he didn't get the beat. Mm -hmm. The song wouldn't have got placed. Like, he placed the song. Right. I guess he was arguing with, like, a loop maker. Oh, uh, okay. So is, the question is, did he is he saying he made the beat? He got the beat placed. Okay. I'm not sure if he made it, though, but... I mean, if, in that case, it's kind of diff different if he if he made it or not. But I'm just speak from if he made the beat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like, you know, if he made something with, on the beat and then got it placed, then that's fair. You know, like if he want to ask for 60, 70 percent, you know, that's him and that producer understanding. You know, me personally, I feel like I'm just a fair nigga. I might just, you know, shit here. Get half of it, bro. I fuck with you. We got a good relationship. You know, let's keep right. it going. You know, if it's another situation where I feel like I need more, it's because I kind of went out my way and went over and beyond. So, Rich Homie Kwan recently said, y'all producers need to start a band. How do you feel about that? Shit. I guess that's, shit. That's kind of like what producer groups is. Like 808 that's Mafia. Too, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, it's a band. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a group of producers who, you know, under the same umbrella. But, um... As far as like a real band, like, I don't know. 
niggas can perform. A group of producers could set up a tour and do a city okay. tour. And, it might you know what I'm saying? Real. Like niggas down there just play at the niggas' greatest hits or whatever. Some shit, I don't know. Yeah, that actually sounds like a good idea. We might got to put that together. That's yeah. not hard. Producer tour or something, you know. So now we have another new segment called Behind the Favorites. All right. So I'm a name, some of your placements, and mm. then I'm I need to know what's your two favorite from the list and the story of how they came together. Okay. So See What I'm Saying by Money Back Yo, Crazy right. Crazy by Nardo Wick, Hot Shit by Cardi B featuring Kanye West and Little Dirk, and Never Sleep with Little Baby featuring Travis Scott. Oh, um, see what I'm saying? I like that one because I made it hands on with Money Bag. Um we basically, um, I, I had been going to Miami. Like I go to Miami to work with Bag all the time. And this one time he had this, um, this beat and this chord that he wanted to make some shit too. And he had already had a uh, drum guy through the drums and shit. And he wanted me to um, make a melody. So he, he played it and I just cooked up the, the shit right there. Like right then and there, he was like, yeah, that's it right there. Like that's a go. So. It came about and shit, and now this shit going crazy. You know what I'm saying? It's a big radio song. It's going crazy in the clubs. It's just one of them big summer anthems that came out. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Sure. That was definitely one of the ones. Yeah, so yeah. you prefer to be hands-on and in the studio? Yeah, well, I prefer to talk about me being hands-on compared to, like, it being the situation where, you know, you might work with somebody else or send it off or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I don't like speaking on shit, like, you know, outside of what I actually was it or experience you know what i'm saying because it's kind of like no for sure you know it's like do you really know because you wasn't there yeah so okay yeah. so i got a few more questions for you before yeah. we wrap it up so how was it working with dj khaled on god did oh uh, it was good because every time i go to dj khaled house it's always a vibe it's always like something that i take away from that shit and just be like damn this nigga DJ Khaled, you know, he, I see why he, where he at in his career because he just always motivating the nigga. He always hands on. If he don't like something, he ain't gonna, you know what I'm saying? He ain't gonna be afraid to tell you what to change or whatever, you know? So it's just always a good uh, vibe and I always learn a lot from him, just even outside the music. Like he always encouraged me, like, and, and I, I talked to him about like real estate and shit. Like, you know, just, he just give me a lot of encouragement and shit. So. Um, when it kind of God did, um, he had, um, I had produced the songs with him and had Mike Dean come in too and do some shit on it. And it was just, shit, That's shit cool. went perfect. Yeah. So give us a gem from DJ Kelly. Like a gem from? Like some advice he gave you. I mean, shit, the most, the most, the most important thing that I learned from DJ Kelly is keep consistent like I told you no matter what like fuck what they say you know right. they, you gotta always be consistent with it so like when it comes to being consistent I learned from him like even social media like when this nigga drop his music he gonna promote that shit down to six months non-stop like yeah. every day every other day he posting like nowadays point. artists you know get a song posting one time and they think that's gonna do it a couple of reposts on the store this nigga Kelly, he gonna post promote this shit every day, every day, times yeah. a day. And, and he basically just always told me to be consistent with whatever I'm doing and don't, you know what I'm saying? Feel like I, you know, doing anything wrong. It's just always you what you focus on, stay at it. For sure, I think being consistent is like the number one key in this industry. Like, yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be consistent. So sicko mode is going on ten times platinum. How do you feel about that? Like. Did you think this song would go that far? No, nah, I didn't think that song was. I knew I knew it was gonna be a big song, but I knew I didn't know to what extent how big it was gonna be. You know, um, and just the fact that it went diamond so quick, that shit was crazy. Like, yeah. That shit, what it went diamond with like a year ago or something. I think so. But it was like the song had only been out a couple of years and it already went diamond. It's like, you know. Big classic hits ain't even diamond, diamond yet. yet. That yeah. shit crazy when you think so about it. They, they let you know billions of streams and shit. You know, that shit crazy. Like You achieved something some OG producers didn't even achieve yet, you know? Yeah, that's crazy. A diamond producer is different. A lot of people can't say they're a diamond producer. So how will you keep up to date and consistent with your sound? Uh, you just adjust to it um the industry and what the wave is and also understanding being humble enough 
me being humble enough to know that my time has come and my like my hype has came and you know i'm not in my peak yet though but the hype moments have came where it's like my sound but it's also like me understanding where my sound is like an og sound where it's always going to be me and keeping that in mind too where i'm just not giving up on it or feeling like you know um it's it's just like played out you know just staying with the new wave working with the new artists the upcoming artists getting them on take key beats how do you, how this artist sound on one of my beats you know what i'm saying so, so who's an upcoming artist that you want to work with that you haven't worked with yet oh uh, boston richie for sure oh uh, that would be hard as fuck yeah I, i'm fucking with him um, that would be hard as fuck and then get future on it that would be raw as hell yeah that'll be cold um i feel oh, like yeah we got to get that playing motion yeah i feel that's like that's hard. gonna be that's gonna be hard when that happens that's gonna be hard as fuck i can't lie so I saw that you said that you choose to mainly use minor chords instead of major chords when you're mm -hmm. producing. So what made you choose this technique? It's just what I started, how I started doing um, with my sound. So I look at it like when I was doing minor chords, that's when I made them beats and songs and shit like Look Alive and whatever. It just was the sound that motherfuckers gravitated towards. It wasn't like, you know, no, um, it was like sadder like darker, like creepy shit. Yeah. And that's what kind of like put me in my bag, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's why it's hell. Yeah. So that's that's, that's my sound, you. so you know, I just grow it. Which is most, what most producers in the trap scene use anyway, minor skills, so. So with Look Alive, I mean like, that was like one of the first songs that like kind of took over TikTok. How did that feel? Like seeing everybody Mm. Literally the whole internet doing videos to your song. That shit was crazy. Uh, and it's it's kind of crazy like with TikTok too because it's like even with nonstop like the, you know, like the TikTok, it had went famous on TikTok with the, the switch. Switch, switch. And it, it just recently went viral with another song mixed with it or some shit. I can't even think the name of it, but it's crazy how TikTok keep a lot of your songs um like relevant, relevant over time. Yeah. Like you wouldn't expect it, but um, I know I had said in my other interview with um with uh with uh me and Dollars worth the game about how um a lot of songs nowadays go viral on TikTok and it don't last as long it, as long you know because it's so many songs it's just so saturated now so it's like when it when it become like those moments where me speaking from a song. That I already been I had a hype big moment. Yeah, it was and already it, a hit, and, and then, then it, it comes. Yeah, TikTok. that's that's crazy. Like to think of like, damn, that shit really, you know what I'm saying? Like, go yeah. crazy. And from my understanding, you can get publishing on TikTok, TikTok yeah. now. Yeah, they that's crazy. Did you ever see yourself producing for an artist like Beyonce so early in your career? Um, no, I didn't expect it to happen. You know, I just it was like, damn, like when it come to Beyonce, she just been so so much of an idol my whole life. Like all my family love Beyonce. Everybody, you know what I'm saying, love Beyonce. Love Beyonce. So just for me to be able to create that shit was just like, damn, I must really be doing something right, you know? So I've seen you work with artists like Eminem and Miley Cyrus. Like, mm -hmm. were those placements, like, did you set those up? Were those like on purpose? Were those accidents? Like, how do you feel about working with artists that, you know, most producers would never even, you know, think to get in with? It really was they teams, cause, um, uh, I think the Miley play got set up through, uh, it was uh, Ryan Press and uh, Jim Coutinho. He was at, uh, I think, RCA, Sony, some shit like that. And he set the play up where I can just do some um, drums on it and shit on the song. And when it came to um, the Eminem, it was his team had reached out to me and shit. So, you know. It was, cool to, it was cool to work with him too, so I want to do some more shit with him too. I think that'd be cool. With Eminem, yeah, that's It'd be I'm cool saying. to do some more shit with him, for sure. You should, for sure. So in 2019, you sampled bounce artist DJ Jubilee and mm -hmm. Cameo Candy for Beyonce and sampled Brooke Benton for Drake's Jimmy Cooks. How did you choose these songs to sample? Or how do you normally choose songs to sample? Um, I've always been the type of person that likes to sample. That kind of like how I, that's one of my specialties that people like people know but it's never been like a big like wow factor for people when it come to my sampling but 
that's all like my main thing that I love to do, like listen to old songs, like realize like it's a it's a, a, a pocket in that song that I can really chop up and do my thing to make it sound like some whole different shit and just run with it, you know. Um, so I just that sampling is something that I I kinda like started out doing when I was younger, like even with like Key Glock, we had old songs that I used to sample and shit like um just like old I can't even think the name on, but like old seventies soul songs and shit like that, like, you know. Just something I always love doing. That's hard. You have a lot of Key Glock songs, like Ambition mm -hmm. for Cash and Russian Cream. Can we expect the tape from y'all soon? Shit, we need to. We got so many songs, shit. You know? That'll be hard. Y'all should definitely lock in and do that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think that'll be cool, though, for sure. Just, just for old days' sake. Like, you know, I'm looking we, out for that one. We got, shit, what, three hits? Three certified songs? Yeah. Like, Ambition for the Cash, Russian Cream, and uh, Sin Six. Oh yeah. Then like, we got some more shit finna get certified too. So me and Glock, it yeah, only makes sense. We got yeah. that chemistry too. So it's like, even when we in the studio recording shit, you know, he, I make a, I'm, a, I'm the type with him that I can cook up right there and, you know, whatever he fucking with, vibe with, or whatever, I'll be like, this is it, or whatever, however it go, he gonna go right in there and record to this shit, freestyle. Yeah, y'all gotta do a tape though. That'd be raw as hell. Yeah, and then you know he cool. just like coming off a tour and just getting back in his bag like I think like that'll be the, like the perfect way for him to come back out like yeah take Keith I feel like he like take as well as yeah him. I feel like this hard and I feel like he he's so established in his own lane that That's it's like true. his fans are like core fans for him that like that hard fan yeah, they're base solid like a yeah. real solid fan base a lot of artists don't have that nowadays but he has an actual solid fan base like right. no matter what he dropping they tuned in yeah yeah so this is a little off topic, but what's a song that you listen to that nobody would expect you to listen to? Um, let me see. I'll show you. Let me show you. No, I want to see. Let Let's see. see what your playlist looks like. I can't play it on camera. We're going to get a flag, but um, <laughs> let me see. Larry June. I fuck with Larry no, I June. I fuck with Larry June. Um, Gotta keep the old Chief Keith. Burner Boy. You listen to Burner Boy? Yeah, I fuck with Burner Boy. Okay. Money Man, one of my favorite artists, you know. Oh, like I, okay. man, I fuck with Money Man, extra tough. Um, I don't want to say his name wrong, Sampho. Let me see. Uh, I'm not sure how to say that. Yeah. I'm don't gonna don't turn me up if I say it that wrong. I'm gonna go but check yeah. it out though. <laughs> I fuck with Schoolboy Q. Okay. Um, let me go to some more with some in depth artists that y'all really want to speak like outside of hip hop. Uh, I'm gonna say you listening to any country music, I like, any rock? Oh, uh, Aloe Black. Mm. I, I fuck with Aloe Black. I think he got a a good ass voice. Like you know what I'm saying? That's like kind of like country type shit. Whatever pop country like in that line. Um. Do you have any Latin songs? I'm working on a song right now. Okay. Um. Oh, Currency, one of my favorite artists too. Um, oh, that's dope. I fuck with Hot Boy, just the Timberlake. Ah, his old Wait, shit. Wait, which Hot Boy? You know it's a lot Hot Boys. Uh, the the Florida rapper Hot okay, Boy. Okay, with the two eyes. Yeah, I um, think Hot Boy hard as fuck. Just the Timberlake and Timberland. I like all they old shit. That's some shit yeah. I really, cause cause you know just the Timberlake from like Memphis. Really? Yeah. That I did not know. Yeah, he's from I outside like of Memphis, the same area. You know what I'm saying? Like. But you know they say like it's Memphis and then it's the rest of Tennessee. Yeah, be fuck everybody, but <laughs> you know he from the city. We just gonna say it, shit. Who else? Tyler the Creator. Oh, I love Tyler the Creator. See it. Okay, um, you listen to some some good shit. Yeah, Got a I good be playlist. So many motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? I just bump. Um. You got a versatile ear. Yeah, for sure. I can't. I don't want to say his name wrong. I don't know how to say it either, yeah, but he yeah, hard, yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. So what's some some placements that you have coming out that you're excited about? Um, I don't like jinxing myself because I would be sick as hell when I be speaking on placements. I did that shit with the J Cole shit. I was mad as hell. This shit ain't come up. Oh, oh, damn, see. this shit because you know it's, it was like you be expecting this shit. You you want to be happy and you know tell motherfuckers or whatever or show the world. Then that shit don't never come out. 
Nah, swear to God. Yeah. That's why I don't be like it saying that shit. I ain't gonna lie. But J. Cole was one of the placements who I thought was gonna be one of them giants. Would come out, whatever. It might still come out. You never know. I don't know. Probably the same. Yeah. But nah, I don't, I don't really just say what placements I got. I have the time producers don't be knowing to the. Sure. Yeah, it's to already the, out. You know, to <laughs> so all, all, all the paperwork coming because you know, artists don't be knowing when they want to release certain songs or the labels might. You know what I'm saying? Be like, yeah. all right, we're gonna go on and put this out now. Then you get the car or whatever type of shit. So that's for sure. So to end it with our last question, what piece of advice did you wish you received in the beginning of your career? Um, patience. You know, um, patience is something that I'm working on to this day. Um, if I would have learned to be more patient about shit in the beginning of my career, I probably would have, you know, been at that, that point now where I mastered it or, you know, really tapped into with my patience. So it's now I'm working on it as I'm older, I'm 26 now, I'm working on being more patient about a lot of shit and understanding like, you know, it ain't everything that gotta happen in the day. Right. You know what I'm saying? You ain't gotta rush yourself, you ain't gotta beat yourself up, You you know, Take deep breaths, you know, meditate. You feel me? Just understand that God gonna guide you the right way and just have that faith in them. You know, just patience can be can, can so broad to fall in so many categories in life where you have to understand that's the right thing to 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 do and, and to be for yourself mentally. You know, just understand understand that patience is something that I wish I would have learned. You know. Like that what is that line? Patience is a virtue? Yeah. That's the one for sure. I definitely gotta work on my patience too. Yeah. But that's a wrap, y'all. Thank you, Take Keith, for coming out. We appreciate you. This was a dope interview for sure. Yeah, I definitely sure. learned a lot. Appreciate y'all.